right? And so, and they didn't, they didn't really think that, hey, we can or need to upgrade. We're not going to get the, the value from, from doing that. And so we just acquired one less than a year ago. Podcast. I'm your host, Josh Apple, founder and CEO of Appleman Capital. Today we're joined with Marcus Long, founder of a long of Long Legacy Capital, has transformed real estate investing to create impact and legacy with over $95 million in assets and extensive experience. He's a mentor and a coach dedicated to family, education, and community. Marcus, we appreciate you coming on the show today. If you could let the listeners know a little bit more about yourself. Yeah, thanks, Josh. I appreciate you having me on and the opportunity to, to share with your audience as well. Um, I'm a husband, father of a nine and a six year old, and I spent uh, a little over 21 years in the military, just transitioned out of the military uh, about 15, 16 months ago or so. And so I was a, a cryptologic warfare officer for a couple a couple decades doing signals intelligence and opportunity to serve on ships, submarines, aerospace data facility. Uh, as an exchange officer to the United Kingdom. And so pretty, pretty wide range of experience and enjoyed that for uh, a long time. But, you know, towards the uh, towards the end of my career, as I had a couple little ones kind of decided that uh, I wanted to transition into something a little bit more conducive to, you know, to raising the family uh, from a lifestyle perspective. And so uh, I had invested in real estate, um, you know, most of my military career and not, not necessarily super intentional. Uh, or focused early on, but you know, as I kind of got towards the end of the career, decided that uh, that that was the the medium that I wanted to you know continue to to serve others in my post military uh, life, and so it kind of started getting um, more focused and, and systematic about it in the last couple of years, and that's what I transitioned to doing full time um, after after the military. Uh, tell us about your first deal in um, in real estate, how that came about, um, how you financed it, managed it, and uh, on from there. Yeah, so you know, my the very first property I had, you know, I, at the time I didn't think of like as a you know quote unquote deal, if you will. I was uh, about twenty two years old. I had I had enlisted in the Navy right out of high school and had been selected for a, a commissioning program, and they sent me back to uh, the University of Missouri. So go Tigers. Um, to get my degree and my commission. And when I did so, I, I bought a, a three bedroom, two bath condo, uh, you know, in, in, a, in an HOA. And I was thinking about like me living there personally. Um, my family had a farm about an hour away. And so that's part of the reason I got a condo is so I could spend some time back helping on the farm and training horses and stuff on the weekends. And not have to worry about, you know, a yard and all that kind of stuff. And I ended up uh, renting a couple of rooms to, to friends of mine. So mm -hmm. kind of house hacking before, you know, we, uh, that, the term was coined probably. And when I left after I graduated, I continued to uh, hold it as a rental and uh, I actually still have that property today, but, you know, didn't necessarily look at it as a, a rental investment property uh, early on. Um, I used my VA loan. So at the time you know, I didn't put any money down um, on it. And I think it was just the, you know, I knew real estate was a Kind of a path to wealth and stuff from a pay down of appreciate or you know the pay down the loan and the appreciation but i think it was you know having someone live there with me paying the mortgage uh, and then continuing to rent it and seeing the equity that i had in it after i left that started making some of those things kind of click um, and kind of led to my path to acquiring more real estate later on so i kind of you know managed it myself while i lived there and then i brought in a third property third party property manager uh, after I left and was, you know, deployed and stuff like that. Got it. So now you're you're sitting on ninety five million dollars worth of um, of real estate. Um, that had to start with a larger property, a, a much larger apartment complex. Can you tell us about how how you came about that and how you even led up to to a, a getting into multifamily? Sure. Yeah. You know, so for most of my career from that very first one until the last probably two to three years, uh, I was mostly focused in single family. And, you know, periodically acquired a single family, mostly like as a rental. And at the time that I kind of moved into multifamily, I probably had about 15 or so doors. So not like a, a massive portfolio or anything, a small single family portfolio. And I knew that I had a lot of what I'd done to that point had been kind of opportunistic, right? Like as, as some opportunities, mostly back around my hometown or in Missouri, which where I was originally from became available. You know, I acquired them. I rented them out. 
but I, I wasn't always necessarily super systematic about you know looking for new opportunities and the pace at which I was acquiring them. But when I made that decision to start my off ramp out of the military for you know family reasons, I knew as like if I'm going to go real estate full time, that I had to be more systematic about how I did that. And I looked at by this point in time, you know, started getting education on a lot of the different different strategies uh, that are available, and you know, through a lot of conversations with friends and mentors and partners, uh, you know, decided that multifamily was the path that I had desired to go. And my final tour was actually in uh, in the United Kingdom. And when I moved to the United Kingdom, I had invested passively in a handful of syndications, multifamily and mobile home park syndications and stuff myself. So I had become more familiar with, you know, that strategy and the benefit of uh, passively investing in them. And, you know, I kind of just desired to, to move in that from an active role and to share those opportunities with a lot of my, you know, my peers and, and friends that I had connected with over the years who continued their military careers and were stationed all over the country or throughout the world that might you know, want to be invested, uh, but don't necessarily have the, the time or desire to, you know, learn to be on the active side. And so uh, I had some close connections that I had through masterminds or other military friends that had started. Uh, becoming general partners and stuff and you know, kind of talk to them and said, Hey, like, here's the value that I think from my, you know, 15 years uh, in the real estate industry that I can bring, you know, to a, to a general partnership team doing syndications and kind of started to, to partner with them. And uh, you know how, how it goes when you like deliver value uh, to, to a team and, you know, they delivered a lot of value to me and things kind of started rolling from there. Uh, you know, and here we are 800 plus units later. Yeah, yeah, no, it's, it's definitely finding your superpower and finding out how you can help others and and help others get their time back too. That uh, that is tremendous value to a team, and that helps helps scaling as well. Absolutely. Uh, what areas are you all investing in? Uh, ge geographically. Yeah. Yeah. So primarily, like a, a large portion, probably about uh, fifty to sixty percent of my portfolio is in Tulsa or in the Tulsa MSA. Uh, have about you know maybe another 20 25 percent in texas and then the, the remainder in kind of the nashville or murfreesboro um tennessee area got it what are you seeing with um with your all's occupancy and uh rent elections and so on and so forth so i would say like uh overall you know particularly you know i'll speak to, to tulsa where a bulk of it is you know most of our our stuff is is pretty good, 95 plus uh, percent occupied. Some close up to 100, except you know just the monthly, the monthly turns. You know, probably our lowest performing um, property in in Tulsa is you know just under 90 percent um, occupied. But our collections across the board there are are pretty solid, and I think that that you know I think that speaks a lot to we have a really really good third party property management team that we have, you know, we see them as a, as a real partner and um, they manage all of our properties in the Tulsa MSA. And I think just the culture that we have created as a, a team with them and then the culture that we create in the communities that we tried to build at those properties, um, you know, from the beginning, bringing in the right residents to, to live there. And then just the way our on-site teams interact and engage with the residents and, you know, sometimes there's some, you know, some gamifying it, you know, you know, we'll do like a raffle for everyone that pays on time and stuff. We'll throw them in a raffle for a free TV or whatever it is, you know, different types of things like that. But I think a lot just goes to the, the community and the culture uh, that we create there. So really good in, in Tulsa and really in Texas, our property, you know, we have some stuff in like College Station um, around Texas A&M and stuff. It's pretty, pretty solid. And, uh, you know, I'd say down in, in Nashville, um, you know, not not bad, probably not as good as our Tulsa stuff because of a lot of the new builds and the competition that um, that has been there. You know, a lot of the new builds, I think, are having like concessions uh, and things like that. So there's yeah. some, you know, even if it's not a direct competition from a class perspective, uh, them just trying to build up their occupancy, there's um, some competition there. What uh, what class are your all's at, assets? Yeah, I would say like the majority of our stuff is probably C plus, B minus um, assets. You know, with the exception of our uh, college station asset, which is uh, 2012 more of an A class. Got it. Um, do you all you all mix it up with subsidy programs? We really haven't messed with. Uh, I shouldn't say messed with, but we haven't really dealt with any uh, subsidy programs really to date, other than you know, 
you know, a, a number of particularly like COVID and then after there's programs and a lot of programs in Oklahoma and stuff that help with uh, residents, you know, on a case by case basis when they're in need of uh, fulfilling that. But from like a Section 8 or anything like that, we don't have any of that in our uh, communities. Got it. Yeah. And um, we, we've done quite a bit and it's just, I mean, just like clockwork every month, the rent comes in on time because we're, we're in C plus to, to be, I'd say B minus workforce housing. So it's, um, uh, it's not bad to integrate maybe uh, like 20, 15, 20% of the uh, community and with uh, the subsidy programs. So you just got to do, do your screening and uh, make sure you check all the boxes. But uh, for the most part, it's, it's not been bad. It continues to perform month over month. Um, it just helps offset the uh, the market rate and then chasing down rents too. Uh, what um, are, are as far as your your third party property manager? Uh, how many how many units do they have under management of your alls? So for us, I think we're, we're probably uh, somewhere between five and seven hundred in uh, Oklahoma. Got it. Got it. Yeah, they're they've got a very vested interest with you all to keep you happy. Then we're about twenty. I think probably. 25% or so of their uh, overall portfolio. Yeah. Yeah. And, and then of course you get economies of scale on their side too, with uh, asset management and uh, uh, crews and turns and uh, I'm sure material purchasing. So it, it kind of balances out for sure. Uh, yeah. There's a lot of, a lot of benefits, you know, I mean, uh, they, they've really helped us, you know, as owners look for efficiencies, we've recommended some stuff from a property management perspective and they've been very open to, uh, implementing different ways, you know, like communication and, and stuff. And, you know, as you mentioned, like the economies of scale of, you know, material manpower. And when we get to that point, you know, that number of, of properties in the portfolio there, you know, not only, you know, generally we have one leasing person, one maintenance person per property, you know, around a hundred units or so, but when we get to that many, we can kind of afford to have some like floater maintenance people or, you know, some specialized um, people that can bounce between and help, uh, different, different properties and spread that cost across the, the different ones. So, yeah, certainly there's been a lot of benefits to to both sides, you know, from a, even an efficiency of communication. You know, when we do our asset management day, it's just 30 minute calls right after one after another. Uh, instead of bouncing around with different formats and styles of different owners, they get to work with, you know, one owner that entire afternoon of, of communication. Yeah, yeah, that's that's huge. Um, are you all uh, doing a business plan value add, renovating the units, and and then leasing up from there? Yes. So I would say that you know most of the acquisitions that we have are probably in the ballpark of you know ninety four to ninety six percent occupied when we acquire them. So they're they're generally fair, like stabilized from an occupancy perspective. Sometimes they you know they just aren't really necessary. They're below market rents a bit or they, you know, there's some efficiencies in operations. Um, some of them occupancy was very good, but, you know, they didn't necessarily have to upgrade units a lot to keep it occupied and stuff. And so generally that's stabilized cash flowing when we acquire them, but there are, so they're probably more uh, in the true sense, probably more core plus, you know, there are some value add components, if you will, uh, both from upgrading units as, as well as some of the operations. Um, so not a lot of needing to increase occupancy but we're able to increase rents, you know, as we do some of the, the updates. Got it. What kind of updates are you all doing when you do renovate? You know, it's, it's a little bit, even though it's all Tulsa, it's a little bit dependent on kind of the sub markets uh, because, you know, for example, you know, one sub market, you know, maybe we do some, you know, new flooring, new paint, maybe it's a, a upgrade, some of the countertops or something. So some of them are a little bit uh, more cabinets and things of that nature. And in another sub market, you know, when we acquired it, the previous owner really wasn't doing much kind of upgrade. They just took care of the basic maintenance in the, in the term because they were staying 100 percent occupied. Right. And so and they didn't they didn't really think that, hey, we can or need to upgrade. We're not going to get the, the value from from doing that. And so we just acquired one less than a year ago, you know, testing a few with some minor upgrades to see like, hey, can you you bump the rents enough to to make it worthwhile or do we need to do that? And so it's kind of uh, even sub market specific as to, you know, what what quality or which ones we do. Yeah, for sure. You got to weigh out what, what what the comps are. And uh, in some cases you can be a market mover just by adding on some um, uh, different amenities, even like a granite countertop and uh, new hardware. Uh, we, we typically do the black, white and a gray color scheme, final plant flooring. Um, 
we found it easier to keep the units leased up um, and easier to, to lease immediately when um, just have more modern looks renovations. So it's a, uh, there, but yeah. it does cost money. So there's plus. Yeah, minus. That's the, the one I was mentioning before when we first went to walk it, you know, the units weren't necessarily in bad condition, but you'd walk in and, you know, the appliances, there'd be a black appliance and a white appliance and maybe a stainless steel appliance or, or just a mixed match of whatever was available and stuff. So sometimes even just like having everything like, you know, match and, and look the same um, is a, an upgrade from kind of walking in and it being kind of a hodgepodge of different things. Yeah, yeah, for sure. So when you help your potential investors uh, figure out passive investing, what are some things um, that you talk about and maybe some uh, some nuggets that uh, they don't know about? Yeah, so I think that, you know, about 75% of my investors at the moment are kind of military connections, either of my own or my wife. She's uh, on active duty as well. And so, you know, across a couple of decades of military connections. And so some of them have never really invested in real estate that much uh, previously. Some have, you know, some single family rentals or different things like that. Some maybe have invested in syndications before. So various levels of experience. But I think, you know, a lot of people, when they think about investing in real estate, they think of like, having a long-term rental or something of that nature and just don't know the various options or strategies that are out there. And so as I, I start to have these conversations with a lot of my potential investors, one of the first things I really just want to understand, like, what is their goal, you know, financially and like as a family and stuff, and what are they looking to get out of it? And when I say that, like, you know, financially, maybe it's like, you know, are they looking for cash flow? Are they looking for, you know, maybe they're, they're content with their paycheck and stuff. They just want the growth over time. Are they looking for tax benefits? Because across real estate, there are different strategies that might be, you know, better or worse for certain ones, pros and cons. And then as a family, you know, trying to help them, if they're just like, hey, I want to get into real estate, understand like how active or involved do they want to be in real estate or do they legitimately just want to be passive? They want to be hands off. They just want it in their portfolio. So really kind of digging in to see kind of what they are are looking for and then trying to help, you know, give them some options of like, hey, maybe, you know, what we do in multifamily and syndications is a good avenue because of X, Y and Z. Or maybe, you know, I have a military uh, connection that says, hey, I've got this bucket of capital, but we'd like to use it for a down payment in two or three years uh, when we PCS to our next duty station. Well, the syndication is not the right option for you because your money's probably still going to be tied up. But, you know, maybe I can help you get into private lending or something uh, else that you can have your money back in a shorter term. So trying to help them, uh, you know, understand that there's some different options out there that may or may not align uh, better with their goals. Yeah, that's that's huge. Just uh, just discovering those different options too, instead of just the stock market, and then you're in total out of total control. Um, what are some some skills or lessons that you've gained through the years of being both in the military and then uh, multifamily? Yeah, so you know, I think that there's hopefully there's quite a few of them, but um, you know, I think a couple of things that like transition. Um, some things I probably started to get from the military and maybe transition into, into multifamily, you know, I think both from like a leadership perspective and building teams and communication, uh, some of my latter uh, tours in the, in the military, you know, I was working a lot with, uh, contracts and whether that was putting together, um, teams of different contractors or, you know, trying to raise capital from different organizations to uh, acquire equipment and programs and things like that. And so I think being able to, to communicate and to tell a story and, you know, try to help people understand what the objective was, whether that was to, you know, people that worked for me or for people that might be bringing capital to, to run a help run a program and stuff has transitioned uh, a lot for me into what I'm doing today. And so like, you know, when we put together uh, a business plan, you know, as our team and the general partners, being able to kind of to, to tell that story to potential investors and help them kind of understand it, because, you know, it can be, I don't want to say complex, but there are a lot more moving parts. And, you know, there's like this legal paperwork and there's like more partners involved than, than we think of on like single family uh, teams and stuff. And so to, being able to sometimes simplify, you know, tell the story, but to be able to simplify that um, where they're not confused and stuff, I think is is probably one of the things i think another one that kind of comes from 
the military is just our ability to to be flexible. You know, a lot of times, you know, I, I say, we, you know, we train for half of a year to go to a certain a geographic area in the world, in the military, or maybe you train for a certain mission. And then, you know, right at the last minute, your, your mission's changed. You're going to a different part of the world and stuff, and you just have to kind of be flexible. And I think that happens in, in uh, you know, real estate and multifamily and commercial real estate and stuff in general is that we know that there are going to be things we have to expect the unexpected, right? And uh, things that will come up and just have to be prepared. Like, okay, that wasn't part of the plan, but we prepared to be hit with some stuff that wasn't part of the plan, right? And to be flexible and how do we adjust and go from there? And so those types of things aren't really uh, surprises and, you know, kind of keeping the, keeping the blood pressure low, you know, instead of getting spun up and, and stuff when that kind of stuff happens, just taking a deep breath and being able to, to approach it. Yeah. Yeah. Definitely be flexible. And, um, entrepreneur spirit is to, to just adapt and, uh, and pivot and make, make quick moves and decisions and make it happen. But, um, but yeah, it's, uh, so it's about, especially real estate, real estate's slow moving there too. Things, things will happen, but, um, you know, if you keep your finger on the pulse at the community level, then you can, uh, you engage, um, your, your tenant satisfaction or what things can need to be changed, whether it's management or survey scores on your maintenance or response time on your maintenance, being able to reach people at the office. You can kind of, you can keep your operations tight, keep your tenants happy as if they're your customers. And uh, that helps a ton. I think that's, a, you know, important for us to, you know, sometimes when you're, you're starting in a certain strategy or real estate or whatever, you might, you might not be prepared for that. And so you kind of, you might plan for, I don't want to say best case scenario, but you might not take in some of that stuff into account, right? So I think, you know, as we do, you know, are involved in more opportunities, more experiences, so you learn to to kind of plan for some of that. You don't know what it's going to be, right? It might be a fire in a building. It might be a car running into your building. Um, you know, as you said, some of the, you know, just like maintenance response times or tenant satisfaction or whatever that might be. It could be small, could be big, but we are able to kind of, plan for some of that stuff happening up front. And so when it, when it does happen, it might not be, have been part of the plan, but we, you know, can kind of take some of, uh, you know, we can adjust from it and it doesn't kill us because we kind of you know, prepared financially or from a time perspective um, to be able to account for some of that. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. Uh, absolutely. And then of course, underwriting and, and what is the uh, effective rent roll? And is that going to be the same when you take it over? Cause there's, there's always a disruption when you take over a property and then you find out what happens. Um, very cool. What has been a, uh, a surprise I'll say after y'all have taken over a property that you didn't take into account. Yeah. So, you know, I mean, I think on a couple of the very early, early properties, we, um, you know, we dealt with some things that were like, uh, you know, the occupancy not being quite what it was said to be, you know, there were some leases that were, you know, we, we did the digital due diligence, um, on the, the leases and stuff, but, um, unfortunately there, you know, there were some operators that were, went into a lot of work to make things look like they were, they were something that they weren't right. And so I think a few of those kind of surprises helped us with some of our own due diligence, um, processes and verifying uh, some things, you know, dur during that process and stuff before closing. And so as, as you do a couple of those acquisitions, um, you'll kind of learn. And a couple of our, our early acquisitions were when I was still a couple of the partners we were still stationed in, in the United Kingdom, you know, it was during COVID time. And while we had partners that were, were local and stuff, there were certainly a lot more uh, challenges to try to overcome uh, into verifying uh, some of that stuff. But they have certainly come into play as we implemented processes and further acquisitions yeah yeah for sure um on all of your all's acquisitions they're all syndications what uh what's your all's typical structure that investors can expect yeah so for the most part you know we we are kind of a 70 30 uh split you know probably in the ballpark of uh seven percent pref something like that anything else in the structure part or is that pretty much what you're asking that, that's pretty much it and then um what are you all seeing out there on on your acquisitions pipeline? Are you all still purchasing, waiting for things to settle in? Yeah, so I mean, we have been we've been fortunate, you know, even with last year being a um, a pretty slow year, I think across the board for a lot of people, uh, we still acquired a couple 
little over a couple hundred units, um, a little over 20 million in, uh, in, in acquisitions there. And so we had, uh, you know, some of those were just relationships that we had uh, developed. And that's really where a lot of our acquisitions are, are coming is not necessarily, you know, stuff popping up on a market, but just like developing relationships with uh, potential sellers. Uh, sometimes with our, our property manager, when she knows uh, another seller that's looking to offload something, uh, some different things like that. And so while we have um, some of those acquisitions were longer, you know, it took longer to, to get them closed because of stuff going on in financing or you know, negotiations or things like that. They were a longer process than many of our previous uh, acquisitions were, but we've still been fortunate uh, to kind of continue a fairly steady uh, steady acquisition. So that, that said, you know, going into to this year, uh, we will continue to to analyze and to to make offers, but we're uh, we're really focused on uh, the team's really focused on dialing in the operations and stuff as well. You know, I mean, I think we have some we have some phenomenal asset managers uh, that do a great job already, and we're just trying to kind of take that to the to the next level because, you know, when we look at some of these past few years where the market kind of could help people ride a little bit, or there's just constant rising rents and stuff, and when that's not that's not happening. You know, I think we've really got to dial in the, uh, the operations to make sure that we're running uh, efficiently as possible. Yeah, for sure. And now's a great time to keep on sharpening the ax and get, get uh, hone in on operations as that's the, uh, operations is the bloodline today. Uh, the tighter you've got everything and, um, uh, finger on the pulse, the, uh, the better it runs for sure. Very cute. Uh, Marcus, if, um, if someone wants to reach out to you and, and uh, learn more about yourself and, uh, and your old company and how y'all do things, how can they get a hold of you? Yeah, you, know, you can always go to alonglegacy.com. That's alonglegacy.com. You know, there's a page on there that has a, a calendar. You know, if you want to set up a call to uh, connect with me, my email address, you know, Marcus at alonglegacy.com. My social media is all on there. So yeah, if anybody's happy where they're just getting started and trying to figure out, you know, what their a good strategy for them to go in and is, or just want to connect and uh, chat, hear about more about what we're doing, happy to happy to talk to them. Awesome. Marcus, we definitely appreciate you coming on the show and uh, certainly look forward to following you and we will talk soon. Awesome. Thanks, Josh. All right. Thanks, Marcus.